the Adu attack with renewed ferocity. The sound was horrendous. Green tracer whacking into the fork. Mortar bombs rained down. A sheet of lead, basically. A, a real firestorm. Now, a report from one of the most important, yet least known, countries in the Middle East, the Sultanate of Oman. It's been hailed as the greatest secret war in SAS history. If they'd been defeated at the Battle of Mirbat, Russian plans for a communist foothold in the Middle East could have succeeded. Welcome to Heroes Behind Headlines. I'm your host, Ralph Pizzullo. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, Pete Winner, a legendary member of the top secret British SAS, also known as the Special Air Service, and often referred to as the Regiment. Founded during World War II, the SAS is the world's first modern special ops unit focused on counterterrorism, hostage rescue, and covert reconnaissance. It became the inspiration for special operations units around the world, including U.S. Delta Force and SEAL Team 6. British SAS operators are only deployed during the most challenging and highly classified missions. Pete has the distinction of participating in two of the most spectacular, the Iranian embassy siege in London, which played out on live television in 1980, and today's story, the legendary Battle of Mirbat. Like Black Hawk Down and the Battle of Thermopylae portrayed in the movie 300, the Battle of Mirbat pitted an overwhelming force against a brave few, in this case 400 Russian and Chinese trained rebels against the mere nine SAS operatives. The nine SAS soldiers changed the course of Middle Eastern history. Pete was among them. He's today's hero behind the headlines. Pete, welcome. And could you tell us a little bit about uh, your background growing up and how you got into special air service? Well, we have to go. We have to go back right to uh, my father's day. You know, he, my father, did um, the whole of the Second World War from se September thirty-nine. He was on the BEF. He was at Dunkirk, Anzio, wow. right through to uh, um, Berlin. The whole, the whole five years, uh, six years, not a scratch. He's, as in his own words, he's uh, seen thousands die, but uh, some of his stories were outstanding. I just got hooked on on the army life, really, and uh, from there, well, that's all I wanted to do, um, and I. Uh, come 15 years of age where which was school leaving age in those days i went straight into boy service but i took my dad's advice he said don't don't pull a trigger son learn a trade yeah. go in the royal go in the royal engineers because you get in, get in civvy street you've got to have something to do so that's what i did i joined the royal royal engineers and became a um, plant operator and um fitter engine fitter uh, and uh, from there into the regular army, and then from there um, did selection and into the SAS. And how big was the SAS at that point? About 300. Ballpark figure. Okay. So a small, very elite unit. Yeah. And the purpose of the unit was mainly what? Well, when I joined, the, the, the purpose of the SAS was jungle warfare. We just fought... Um, a jungle campaign in Borneo for the Sultan of Brunei. And uh, that, that had been a successful win for the British Army. And then heard on the grapevine that something big was going to happen in Dofa in the 70s, you know, because they were, they were getting worried that the uh, Kremlin or the Russians were going to take over the Middle East and we were going to do something about it. And yeah. we did. And so you're protecting the Sultan of Oman, and Oman, just for the the listeners, is kind of a very strategic piece of land which leads to the Persian Gulf, correct? That is right, yeah. The world supply of oil go through the straits at the top of Oman, um, and it's not very wide at all. You, you capture those straits and you've captured the world's oil, you know. Yeah. This and, was and, a situation that was developing. Right, and Oman itself was 
very oil rich as well. Today, it's one of the biggest oil producers in the world. I don't know if that was true back in the 70s, but... It was just starting to be just developed. Starting. Okay. Just starting then. Okay. So when were you deployed to Oman, and uh, how many of, of you were there, and what was the what was the nature of your mission? Okay. Uh, well, 1970, I passed selection and went to B Squadron. There were already SAS out undercover, um, not um, identified out in the Oman, getting things going basically start up uh, when I joined B squadron we uh, were just getting ready to do what they called operation operation Jaguar where we were going to put uh, people actually onto the hill In, if you can imagine Dofar is a huge great plateau that's why the communists um, communist insurgents they dominated the whole of the area they, they had communist troops up there uh, including Russian advisors, etc., etc. Um, so the the idea of Operation Jaguar, um, October 1971, was to go up there. Two squadrons, the uh, first time two squadrons of SAS had been deployed since the uh, Second World War. Two squadrons of SAS and the Sultan's Armed Forces, uh, a force of about probably five, six hundred uh, uh, guys fully tooled up, battle order, and that's what we did. Marched through the night, got up onto the plateau, and from there, from there, it was a heavy sort of combat, day in, day out, a bit like uh, Afghanistan, Helmand, that kind of stuff, every day for, um, I don't know, two, three months until we'd got a firm base on the plateau, set up a... Um, an area that we could uh, control and from there once what we call a fire base from there that was it that was the start of the Dofal war okay so uh let's fast forward to 1972 so now yeah. you're stationed down below the plateau correct on uh, yeah. near, near the sea in a town called Mirbat is that that's correct yeah okay. it was the uh, the monsoon Amazingly enough, we're in uh, Lawrence of Arabia territory, you know, uh, sand dunes and beautiful sunshine. Down in Dofar, they actually have a monsoon period that no runs kidding. from uh, June, July, August, September, where it rains, there's um, fog, mist every day, the, the green grass starts to grow, and this is in the, the middle of Arabia. Wow. So it's, it's a unique place, really, a unique yeah. place. Yeah. So, Usually during the monsoon, nothing ever happens. Even the, the enemy, they retire to their uh, HQ at um, Hauf, uh, which is in the Yemen. And everybody just goes back to bed, basically. Uh, close the whole place down. So we, we came off the hill um, and went to Murbat to, to see out the monsoon, basically. Ah, I see. And that we, we should idea. explain that the, that the rebels were... They had taken hold of Yemen, right, which was to the south. That's right, yeah. A and they were coming up further north into Oman. Yeah, across the right. border, yeah. Across the they border. Were they, they had a Russian and Chinese training teams down there, which trained them up in Russian and communist tactics, and then sent them across the border to uh, do the business, you know. Oman is an oil-rich country at the mouth of the Persian Gulf. At the start of the 1970s, insurgents trained and armed by the Soviet Union and China, known as the Popular Front for the Liberation of the Arab Gulf, were supported by communist guerrillas from South Yemen and were trying to wrest power from the pro-Western Sultanate, who had ruled Oman since the 17th century. This strip of desert, situated along the southeast coast of the Arab Sea, was critically important strategically. If Oman was to fall under communist control, it would allow the Soviets and Chinese to expand into Saudi Arabia and seize their vast oil deposits. This is why the British army dispatched its most elite unit, to help train the Sultan's army and win hearts and minds of the Omani people. Nine of these soldiers were stationed in the southernmost town of Mirbat, on a narrow coastal plain sandwiched between the Jebel Ali Hills and the Arabian Sea. 
Do you want to do you want to name the nine guys and just give like a brief description? Well, well, just talked about Jeff. There was uh, Mike Keeley, captain. Uh, Bob Bennett, again ex infantry. There was Takavizi, Fijian, ex infantry. Labba Labba, ex infantry. Tax Fijian brother. There was Roger Cole, who was ex Royal Army Service Corps. Tommy Tobin. And you're all like in your early 20s? Exactly. Right, so we've had the 18th getting ready to um, leave the area. Hardly anything happened there. The, the Adu, the, the Adu is uh, Arabic for enemy. And uh, every now and again, they'd throw a few mortar bombs in just to let us know that they were <laughs> out there in right. the mist. You couldn't right. see them because of the fog. But they'd throw a few mortar bombs into the town, not many, half a dozen, just to let us know they were still there and waiting for us, you know. And that went on right up until uh, uh, July uh, 72, just before the battle. And what are you doing in the meantime? Are you training or are you, or are you just kind of hanging out? No, we're training the Furka, um, Arab tribesmen who are like um, territorial army. About 40 or 50 guys, you give them a rifle, you know, give them ammunition and uh, they love it. You know, we and we trained them up in tactics, and plus we were running a clinic, hearts and minds. Yeah, you got to do that. You got to win the population over. So you're doing like dental service and medical service, yeah. and so and look, on. and veterinary, looking after their animals as well. You know, their cam their camels. Yeah. And can you describe Mirbat a little bit for the? viewer so that they can get a picture of it it's a pretty primitive little village right well it was medieval when we first went there medieval totally medieval no hospital no clinic um women were still stoned to death for adultery wow. thieves had their uh, hands chopped off um all this kind of stuff wow. um for murderers it was a beheading in in the local square um totally med medieval and a, and a town of, of how many people? A couple thousand? or mm, Yeah, it was only small, small place, yeah. Just a small but, place. But key strategically because of its because of where it was. Yes, yeah, it was a strategic position, yeah. Okay, so let's describe the events uh, leading up to uh, July uh, 19th of 1972, if you would, please. Um, well... As I've just said, uh, we had the odd mortar bomb lobbed in over the last previous few few months. So we got to um, um, July the 18th, 1972. Um, kind of, uh, what could you say? Holiday atmosphere about the place, you know. Um, end of tour fever had clicked in because we knew that in about a week uh, we would be back in Hereford for R&R. &R. Um, boy, were we in for a shock. <laughs> so you were expecting to leave in about a week. Your tour was over. That's it. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. wow. Wow. So that was July the 19th. Okay. Um, and you're living in a, what, what they called the bot house, right? Yeah. Bat, bat being, um, British army training team, uh, bat for sure. Yeah. It, I've seen pictures of it. It's a pretty primitive, primitive structure. Oh yeah, everything was primitive. Yeah, you had to like a draw, mud, mud yeah, walls. And... That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah you've, you've seen them in uh, Afghanistan. Those kind of villages, you know, in in uh, Afghanistan. S same thing, basically. Same thing. Um, no water. You had to collect the water from the well. Uh, no toilet. That was uh, had to be burnt in a hole. This kind of thing, you know. Right. Um, and so you're hanging out at the bot, bot house, nine of you, and you're just getting ready to leave. Oh, yeah, yeah, packing up. In the early morning of July 19, 1972, the nine SAS operators were asleep in the British Army training team house, known as the Bat House, on the northern edge of Mirbat. They were likely dreaming of home and loved ones as their tour was about to end. Since it was the middle of the monsoon season, which made troop movements difficult, none of them suspected that the communist rebels commonly known as the Adu, were about to stage a large-scale attack, or that the resulting battle would decide the outcome of the Cold War in the Middle East. Outnumbered by over 400 to only nine, 
These brave men were about to become the stuff of legend, and the Battle of Merbat would be remembered as one of the greatest military encounters in British history. July the 19th, 1972, uh, before dawn, hundreds of uh, heavily armed uh, communist shock troops moved into position. They uh, set up a, a mortar line and a small group broke away and uh, headed for the uh, night picket or night guard on uh, Jebel Ali. So um, Jebel Ali is uh, still up on the plateau? No, this is on the... Um, only about 400 meters away from the house. Uh, it's like a just like a pimple that the guard used up on the top of the night picket. Uh, sat up there all night, keeping guard, really. Um, so the, they were up there, um, and a small group of Adu were dispatched to uh, kill them, basically. The first realization I had that something big was going down was the sound of mortar bombs uh, exploding around the town. Um, and that was the Adu's first big mistake, opening fire with their mortar line, because it was a mega wake-up call. We all rolled out of our sleeping bags. I pulled on my shorts and uh, desert boots. Um, no Kevlar in those days. Yeah. No, no yeah. body armor. <laughs> no helmets. Yeah, no helmets. Wow. And what time was this? What time in the morning was this? This was about uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. 4 o'clock in the morning. So had they... Not shot the mortars, they could have just snuck right up onto you, right? And and then it would have been all over. They could have used stealth, yeah, which they should have done. But uh, I uh, raced up to my stand to position, which was on the roof of the bat house, mm -hmm. up to the uh, 5 0 Browning. So a 50 cal. Oh, yeah, 50 cal. Loaded it with a belt of incendiary and tracer, cocked the action. And, I, and I'm thinking, uh, where's the night picket? Where are they? Why haven't they uh, been touch, in touch with the, on the Tokai? We had these little walkie-talkies um, called Tokais. So if you hear me talk about a Tokai, it's a walkie-talkie, yeah? Um, why haven't they been on the uh, the Tokais giving us a warning? Where at, Why haven't they opened fire? Well, unbeknown to us, they'd all got their uh, throats slit wow. um, by the, the Adu. Who'd crept up on them on the top of um, how many? How many of them were there? That uh, there was your, there was eight the, up there of the night watch. So they were taken out. They couldn't. Well, warn eight them. of them all got their throats slit. Yeah. Um, obviously, the Adu thought they could get away with that, but unfortunately for them, the Adu, and lucky for us, um, just before the last guy got his throat slit, um, he managed to get a couple of rounds off. From his assault rifle ah. and the Adu thinking the garrison had been alerted opened fire with their uh, mortar line and thank oh, goodness wow. they, thank goodness they did so if that guy was did, a hero for letting oh, yeah, off yeah, those the last yeah, guy to die well, yeah, wow. yeah he, he, say the Adu thought uh, the garrison had been alerted and that's why they opened with their um, uh, mortar line if they'd used stealth it could have been a whole different ball game did, did you hear the shots fired by the by the night watch uh, no I, I didn't i was asleep <laughs> <laughs> wow no i say i just heard the mortar bombs okay In fact, that's what woke me up I, you know i started to take stock of the situation i thought to hit us with this kind of firepower they must they must have um six seven maybe eight mortar tubes in parallel all we had was one standard uh, British Army 81 millimeter mortar and an old uh, Second World War 25 pounder, and only one man to fire it, uh, the great Fijian Laba Laba. One... Those shells are pretty heavy, right? They're... Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, huge task for one man. Yeah, and that artillery piece was not at the bot house, correct? No, it was uh, 800 meters away at, wow. uh, at the, the fort. This is where... Uh, the uh, um, Sultan's Armed Forces uh, had a little HQ there. The land surrounding the British soldiers was arid and inhospitable. The town of Mirbat stood to the south, the Arabian Sea was to their backs, and the rough Jebel Ali hills rose in front of them, north and east. 
The closest base was British Royal Air Force headquarters in the town of Salala, 50 miles north. Pete, knowing they were desperately outnumbered, would make a quick decision to call for air support. But due to the low cloud cover typical of monsoon season, air support would prove problematic at best. The time now was about 0530 hours, and uh, Mike Keeley, the, the boss, and uh, Bob Bennett, his second in command, had done a battle appreciation and realised we are going to need backup soon, big time. So uh, um, Bob Bennett ordered me down the signal shack to uh, uh, establish comms with the HQ 40 miles away. So I applied the safety catch to the 5 O'Brien and as I raced down to the si signal shack, I thought, um, this is war on a shoestring. I mean, where's the dedicated radio operator? There ain't one. Right, that's I'm me. It. Yeah. Yeah, me. Yeah. And yeah. now the 5 -0 Browning is out of action because I had to get down the signal shack. I had to get behind the radio, send a signal to um, uh, HQ. All done in Morse code as well. Couldn't right. use oh. couldn't couldn't use voice because voice can be manipulated. Yeah, yeah. You know, voice can be uh, um, disrupted. So you had to be pretty sharp on the Morse code. So. Uh, their signal strength was five. And what does strength um, five mean? Well, a top signal. So I just gave contact, contact, wait out, and raced back up to the 5 -0 Browning, you know, get behind the uh, HMG, heavy machine gun. The whole area now was alive with um, explosive activity. I couldn't believe it. There was, there was green tracer, because the Yadu, the Russians, they have green tracer. We have red tracer. They have, they have green tracer. Um, Green Tracer was whacking into the building. There was uh, motor bombs raining down. There was RPG. And somewhere I could hear this Spargan Russian heavy machine gun oh, thudding boy. away. I mean, the sound, the sound was deafening. And just then it was starting to get a little bit, bit lighter. The, uh, the, the fog was lifting. It was starting to clear a bit. And there was a shallow wadi over in the, um, Jebel Ali area and I could see these uh, figures bobbing around in the wadi. A wadi is like a little vill a valley, I don't know. Right, wadi. right, like a dry riverbed type yeah, of thing. Yeah, 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 wadi, yeah. yeah. Um, I could see these figures bobbing around. Suddenly about 40 or 50 of them formed up in extended line and started sweeping across our front at wow. speed, heading wow. towards the fort and the uh, 25 pounder, which was obviously there um objective yeah i couldn't believe what i was seeing it was like it was like a hollywood uh, movie you know yeah. where where's errol flynn i couldn't believe what it was like a Holly, it was better than a hollywood movie this was reality you know i just come from uh, early 1970s uk you know uh, uh, elton john david bowie glam rock now i'm transported back to the first world war a frontal assault by um stormtroopers You're back to lawrence of arabia Back to Lawrence of Arabia, yeah. <laughs> so I, I looked across at um, Mike Keeley and Bob Bennett. They were studying the mortar uh, plotter board, plotting a target. So I just shout, contact, contact, enemy, 400 meters, watch my tracer, watch my tracer. Mike Keeley went, no, don't on fire, don't on fire. It could be the night picket returning to the fort. I oh. thought, night, night picket my ass. These guys were in killer attack mode yeah. anyway. The decision was taken out of our hands on the on the uh, town hall roof there was an old boy one of the uh, mayor's askaris he had a bren gun up there and uh, he knew he knew these guys weren't local he knew they were trouble all he could see were heads heads on poles so he squeezed the trigger on the the, the bren gun and whacked into them someone on the bat house roof shouted uh, unleash hell and we opened fire with a relish <laughs> Unfortunately, these these guys were good, well trained. You know, they were they were attacking with a ferocity and uh, blind dedication, which is the, the mark of Russian trained communist troops. But uh, as soon as we opened fire, they all hit the deck, uh, went to ground, uh, split up into small uh, fire teams, uh, light machine gunner, three or four riflemen, and started using field craft. Uh, crawling along shallow stream beds, crawling behind um, rocky outcrops, 
um, to achieve their objective, which made them very difficult. That's why we couldn't hit them. You know, they didn't do a first world war, just keep running it, running into a, into the lead. Right. They'd been trained to, as soon as they heard the first round go off, hit the deck, use field craft, which they did very effectively. That's why they got, that's why they got so close before we shot them all, you know? Um, so, um, they, they, this this is what uh, this is what was happening at that stage of the game. I'd say that was all. That was that was the initial assault of about forty or fifty. Don't don't forget there was a couple of hundred more hanging around, hidden in the in the big wadi over at um, uh, Jebel Ali. And this now you're at like five thirty six in the morning. This light's starting to come up. Yeah, we um, it was about zero six hundred hours. Yeah, and uh, we got a message from uh, Labba that. Um, He'd been shot. An AK-47 round took the bottom of his chin off. And um, on the Tokai, you know, we, we each had a Tokai and we heard that one. I've been chinned, I've been chinned. But I've wrapped a shell dressing round it and carried on with the uh, the fight, luckily. Um, down in the mortar pit, helping with the mortars was Takavizi, his Fijian brother, Um he heard this and he was getting more, more worried by the minute, you know, how what was happening over at the gun pit. How was Labba? He needed a sit rep. So he, he grabbed the uh, Tokai and it was Labba, Labba, send sit rep. Silence. Labba, send sit rep. Silence. Third time lucky, no chance. So he made a, um, on his own initiative, basically, he decided he'd run up to the, the fort reinforce it and find out what happened himself and and that's another SAS secret we can operate without orders we don't need officers to tell us what to do interesting um, interesting we can uh, make our own minds up and decide what to do on the spur of the moment and that's what he did so he he's running what 500 meters or how, yeah how he yeah he grabbed his uh, uh, assault rifle and wow. off he went 800 meters totally um, exposed right yeah um, wow under fire um, 800 meters, uh, bobbing, weaving, running, bobbing, weaving, running, bobbing. Incredible. I could see this green tracer whacking over his head. I thought, any minute now, because I don't forget, I was watching this from the, the bat house roof, but he just kept running. Wow. And as they say, luck shines on the brave, and he made it unharmed. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. And you're giving him cover, as much cover as you can. I, I, Trying I to look for where, where the uh, light machine gun was, yeah. Again, they were they were quite good. They were well trained. The the Adu they were they were using field craft to hide. You know they were good hide their position. They were very good, uh, to be quite honest. Um, but then they were trained by the Russians and the Chinese. You know, um, so um, he made he made the gun pit uh, and uh, you know, jumped into the gun pit and started to help. Uh, um, Labba fire, fire the 25 pounder while that was going on back at the uh, bat house Mike Keeley realised that we're going to get overrun shortly if we're not careful e and executed this is what would have happened uh, overrun and executed You know what was their style in those days of execution? I'm afraid it was a knife to the throat beheaded, two of our guys were beheaded in uh, they were captured and beheaded in, in the Yemen in 1964. So that was in the back of your head. Oh, yeah. We knew that was going to happen to us as well. Um, standard procedure. So um, Mike Keeley realized we we're going to get overrun and executed. So Bob ordered me down the signal shack, call for Star Trek. Star Trek was the code for uh, um, airstrike. So I raced down to the um, uh, signal shack, got behind the rate, reached for the code books. Unfortunately, Everything in Dofa had to be coded because just off the coast of um, Oman on the island of uh, Sakutra, there was a Russian KGB listening post. Wow. So all messages had to be uh, coded. Uh, I decided there and then, fuck it, you know, there and then, throw the rule book out the window. Um, I need to be immediate, you know, no time for, for codes, you know. Um, I even considered sending a, a flash signal 
but that's reserved for nuclear strike imminent. <laughs> so I thought I better not send a flash signal. That might really panic them. That'll so, wake them uh, up in London, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that would have wake, woken them up in London. All right. uh, so I decided next one down, which is up immediate. So I just gave it to uh, up immediate, up immediate, uh, situation serious. Um, on the heavy attack, send Star Trek. On the heavy attack, send Star Trek. On the, over and over again. Back at the back at the gun pit, uh, um, Tack could see Labber firing a twenty five pounder on his own. Wow! Um, so he just shouts in Fiji, and where's your number two? Where's where's the Omani gunner? Where's the Dofaris? And um, Labber shouts back in, in Fiji, and. Uh, they surrendered. They've run up the white flag. They've locked themselves in the um, the foot. They ain't coming out. The situation was desperate. The Adu kept creeping closer and closer, keeping up a steady blaze of AK-47, mortar, and machine gun fire. Meanwhile, the SAS operators were running low on ammo and supplies, to the point that Pete was using butter to lubricate the 50 cal machine gun. Not helping matters was the fact that the 20 or more of the Sultan's soldiers had locked themselves in the fort behind the 25-pounder and refused to come out and fight. The SAS team was on their own. So, this is not good. This is not good. I'm going to have to riff these guys. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to kick ass, and that's what he did under fire. I mean, these guys were getting so close now; the, they were a grenade throwing range. Um, so they were within what a hundred meters or, or less? Probably about at that stage, about a hundred meters or so. Yeah, uh, under fire, he ran to the 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 door of the fort, started hammering it. Come out, you bastards! Come on out! <laughs> Come on out, you cowards! Anyway, one he managed to get one guy to the door. Uh, they, they unlocked the door, and Walid uh, Kalfan, who was the Omani gunner, um, tacked then said, "Follow me." So Tack ran. And jump, Calvin followed him, but immediately, immediately was shot in the stomach. So oh, he was God. out. He was out of the picture anyway. Uh, it didn't kill him, but um, he was out of the picture. So he went wow, down. Wow! So the one guy who he urges to come out of the fort gets immediately gets shot. Yeah, yeah he immediately got so shot. So that's like uh, total yeah. disincentive for the other ones to, to, they, yeah, to, to that's join right, in. Yeah. Right. Yeah, one other did come out, but he jumped straight into the uh, ammo bunker, which was over on the um, over on the left. Um, so that was a situation there. So you're called in for the air air support. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was it was about uh, seven o'clock now in the morning. The, the battle had been raging for about uh, three hours now, and I'm thinking, um, you know, where's Star Trek? You know, it must be over thirty minutes ago that uh, I call for Star Trek where we got to get the jets in or else we're going to get overrun and we're going to get executed. And then, of course, I looked up at the cloud-based dinner and it was down to about 100... Because it was a monsoon. Yeah. The cloud base was um, down to about 150 feet and I guess that's why the Adu picked that morning. They must have read, read the uh, weather report right, and realised right. it was going to be heavy, heavy ah. mist that morning. Jets won't fly. I thought. Oh, we're screwed. The jets won't fly uh, under 150 feet. They are too dangerous. They they attract um, ground fire, you know. So we're not going to get the jets. This is th this is going to literally be a, a fight to the death. And then, incredibly, about 30 minutes later, a, a miracle occurred that the the, the, the mist suddenly kind of lifted to about. 350 feet I uh -huh. thought yeah yeah we could be in with a chance here so applied the safety catch to the five raced down to the uh, uh, five o browning yet again got down and sent um sent a wet rep what they call a wet rep weather report sent a wet rep in clear you know alpha uh uh cloud base 700 meters exaggerate <laughs> exaggerate exaggerate because <laughs> it was all it was only three about 350 anyway it seemed to do the trick was um about uh i don't know um about 15 minutes later two jets suddenly broke through the cloud wow. over Murbat uh, bay wheeling and diving and they did a strafing run up the uh, perimeter wire wow using uh, 
rocket and cam. They didn't last long. They didn't last long. First jet was shot through the uh, tail with Spargan, heavy machine gun from was they they what they did they mounted a Spargan on the top of Jebel Ali when they uh -huh. killed the um the night guard. Right. They then put a Spargan up there, you know, uh, and so good good place to put a heavy machine gun, you know, dominate the area. That was it. We were now and these uh, jets are. Uh... Uh, one pilot, just one man. Yeah, one Jets. man. There, they were a rip off, really. They were what they call Strike Master. They rebranded them. They were so cheap to the Sultan. They were, they were jet trainers. Yeah. In, oh, in okay. UK. They were oh. used for training pilots. Okay. You know. Right. They were, but they were flogged off cheap to the Sultan. Relief from the two Strike Master light attack jets was short lived. One was hit by ground fire and had a limp back to base. Shortly after that, the second ran out of ammunition and had to return to Salala to resupply. Now the tired, injured SAS operator's situation was growing increasingly desperate. The Adu kept coming at them in waves from multiple directions, inching closer and closer until Pete, Tok, and the others resorted to firing at them point blank. The Brits refused to give up, proving in Pete's words that luck shines on the brave as the last remaining jet disappears into cloud is uh, ordinance totally uh, expended um the adu attack with renewed ferocity i mean uh, you know you, the sound was horrendous green tracer whacking into the fort green tracer whacking sparking off the 25 pounder um mortar bombs rain down uh, you know, a sheet of lead, basically, a, wow. a real firestorm. And it was round about this time that Tack got hit. Um, he uh, he took an AK-47 round that lodged millimetres from his spine uh, and also a round creased his skull, you know, creased across his skull. Wow. Um, you know, a quarter of an inch lower, he would have got a third eye. He wouldn't be sat here now or in an eighth of an inch lower. So, you know, he was quite VSI, as we say, very seriously injured. So with with TAC VSI and Labber already weak from loss of blood from the um, the wound on his chin, yeah. they could no longer um, fire the 25-pounder. So the big the big gun uh, fell silent. Um, wow. Labber, Labber then uh, reached for his assault rifle, but he's thinking, I need something better than this. I need something... Um, that I can fire from behind the sandbags and not put them, not put my head up because the, these guys, they had, they were going for headshots. They were, they were definitely going for headshots. Um, he said, I need something I can fire from behind the sandbags, you know? And then he suddenly remembered over in the ammo bunker, there was a 60 millimeter mini, mini mortar, uh -huh. small handheld five by one man. It's an, an American weapon, you know, very handy for, CQB work, close quarter, close quarter battle work, and and and, and uh, Labber thought that's what I need. That's the equaliser. I can fire that and keep me head down at the same time. So right, just poke it above the sandbags and fire. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. keep his head down. And so uh, that's what he did. He, he began to crawl towards the the ammo bunker, which was about I don't know ten feet, twelve feet away. But as soon as he broke cover. From the armored shield of the 25 pounder cut down immediately oh, ak-47 wow. round sliced uh, straight through his um through his neck oh, uh kill, killed him instantly uh the, the great fijian was gone as pete mentioned the bond between the two fijians and the sas squadron talayasi laba laba known as laba and sekonaya takavesi known as tak very close. In a stroke of luck, or you could call it cosmic resonance, Tok just happened to drop by Pete's house while we were recording this podcast. Pete was as surprised as I was. Who better than Tok to describe the heroics of his Fijian brother in arms, Laba? Here's Tok. So I went up, I ran from there to the top, and uh, I went in, I ran straight into the pit where Lamba was. And I said, the first thing I said, why is the fucking on my gunners? <laughs> and these are the people who are supposed to be running the gun. Say, they're not here. I say, I'm going to fucking kick them out of the, uh, at the fort. 
So Lamba agreed. So because you know there's only two of us there, and we're almost surrounded. By this time, the enemy are there, about maybe fifty meters away. Yeah. Wow. So when I say Lamba, I'm gonna get these two fucking gunners out. It took me about what ten minutes. I was kicking the door in, knocking the door for them to open the gate. I speak to them in Arabic. I say, "Quick, open the door." And at the same time, I was kicking the door. I was lucky I didn't get shot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, bullets the, the, flying the, all over your head. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, all over the place. So somehow they opened the door, and I told, I said, I swore to them in Arabic, "Get your fucking ass up here." <laughs> So the two of them, these are the two gunners who were supposed to be running the gun. Yeah, yeah. I said, what are you doing there? You've been hiding there. Get your fucking ass up here. So from there, they followed me. I said, come on, let's run and, and, and duck and dive. So from, from, from the fort to the gun pit, it's maybe five or ten meters away. Okay. So we dodged and run. But I was lucky. I didn't fucking shot. He got shot, though, in the stomach. Okay, wow. so I could not stop and... If I stop, I'd been dead, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you just had to leave him there, huh? I said, I couldn't do anything. Then a guy behind me, another guy, another small guy, Gunner, he followed me. Or he ran across. And I went straight and helped Lumber out. But this guy knew the safest place was to go into ammunition bunker. Yeah. And hide there. And yeah. hide there. So it goes from one hiding spot to the other. Yeah. And and, and they were, I, I think the, the, the right way is shitting themselves, okay? So I ran back to the gun pit with Lumber. The, the guy, Walid, uh, who, who sort of lay there. I couldn't do anything. I knew if I'd stopped, I'd been dead, you know? So I went straight in, jumped in ammunition at the, to the gun pit and helped Lumber out. We waited and waited and, you know, I mean, then I got shot. Then Lumber and I were discussing in Fiji and joking to him in Fiji. And I said, look, keep it, Lumber, keep your ass down, you know? Keep your head down all the time. And he was doing the same to me. He's yeah. he's firing the 50... The... Panda, yeah, 50 Panda. So by this time, I went and helped him out, Okay. Yeah, put the charges in, um, give it to Lamba, Lamba ram it in with a, with a, with a stick, push it in, okay? Then suddenly, I had this um, crack and thumb. Crack and thumb means the bullet is right above you, okay? And I looked, Lamba went across, trying to pick up the 60 millimeter American mortar, which is one of the most accurate one, okay? And I looked straight away, and I saw this bullet, okay? My eyes straight away look at Lamba, and I saw the bullet land on his neck. Oh, my God. And I saw he, he died straight away. And to me, it was the saddest part of my life. Yeah. This is your best friend. Yeah. And that's what happened. Yeah. Sorry. Um, that's okay. I'm, it must have been horrible, horrible experience. By then, okay, it made me more determined, more determined this time. And I was already been shot um, lying in there, okay? And our problem was we had the, what I had the SLR and I was running out of ammunition. So when I ran from the from the from where Pit One was, where our position was, to the hill, okay, I took about five or six set of bandoliers, about three hundred rounds. Eh? So by the time I got there, firing all this now, I was running out of ammunition. Wow! But luckily there was a a guy, Omani Ghana, who is about five yards away from me in the gun pit. This is I the guy who's hiding. Yeah, I said, look, give me some of the ammunition. They've got FN rifle. They take seven point six two. But the magazine will not fit my rifle. So I have to unload it first, reload onto my weapon before I fire it, okay? So all this time, I, I only I can only take about four or five, five seconds, okay, to load it up, fire, then again, unload the magazines from the other one and reload it before I fire again, okay? It's been going on for, for ages, okay? Because I didn't have any choice. You know, my arm was, one of my arm was dead already. And you're shooting with the other arm? Yeah, one arm, left? yeah, yeah. But I said, by this time, I was more determined. And, I, and, and I, no way that I ever, I was going to, you know, surrender or anything. It never entered my head, you know. I was more determined than when Lamba died. And that I'm, was I, the, I would imagine you'd be uh, angry. No, no. By this time, I was, I was patient. And I knew what happened. And I respected that Lamba took the bullet, okay. And I took one too. And I thought, well, the, the only thing to do is to fight on and never give up. And that's why we can continue it. Eh? Okay, Lamba is already dead on the side. You know, yeah. you, I was I, I was there, and the Arab other Arab was um, in the gun pit, not in the gun pit, in the ammunition bunker. The other one was lying on the side of the fort. So we were sort of uh, almost being surrounded, and uh, we were very lucky. Had the enemy known that how many, as only a few of us there, two or three of us there, they would just stand up 
and advance forward. They take a lot of us out, but they didn't. They thought there's more of us there, which was really good. Okay, we were lucky that day. Right, and you're keeping up the fire continually. Yeah, and, we, and keeping up, yeah, you know, as much as I can, you know. So, and we heard on the radio that uh, Mike Keeler coming up with Tommy Tobin. Okay. So, I was expecting them. Then by this time, the the what the the gunfire towards uh, the twenty five pound was very severe. And you could hear it whistling past and you know over me and under me on my left on my right, so I can hear they were they were shouting okay, they were coming running forward to towards our gun pit, so Tommy Tobin was in front, my kill was followed about three or four yards behind him, so Tommy knew, he thought the safest place was to jump inside the, our gun pit, so as he sort of took over and jump. He landed on the on the on the, the sandbags, and the bullet I think about two or three bullets caught his, caught his face, his jaw, so which blew him apart. Oh my God! And I couldn't do anything, so Lab was already dead. Tommy Tobin is basically wounded, you know. His face I could see his face now, you know. So was, now you've got you're you're wounded, Tommy's wounded, Lamba is dead, and you're still on your own with the with the twenty five pounder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was still firing the gun. Yeah, no, I was still firing the. The SLR, which means I got unloaded from the FN, reloaded on my magazine, and do the same again, over and over again. Didn't have any choice. That's the only way to. Do. You couldn't even be automatic or semi-automatic. It's basically no, no, no. Ma uh, yeah. feed, manually feeding the bullets. No, no, in. yes, one, two, three, four, quickly. Eh? Coin my weapon, cock it, fire it, and I go again. Empty the other one, reload, and fire. Wow! All of this while injured in the shoulder, a bullet yeah. through your shoulder. Yeah. Wow. You know. Luckily, they didn't even know how many of us was there. They thought there were still quite a few of us. They could have just stand up and, and walk straight up, you know, without doing anything. Right, right, because how are you going to stop them? By this time, they start lobbing grenades at us, okay? Grenades firing and moving. But luckily, they overcome by, by what we did. And also the firepower from the Fiber Brown and Pete Warren and them. And also other people from around the villages, okay? And some, I think some of the, 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 um, the, so the rounds came up there too. Tried oh, to protect really? us. Some people yeah. from the villages yeah. started to fire yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. So this is in the crux of the battle, and uh, it went on for uh, a good, a good half an hour or long, lot longer. Unbelievable. And are you and, running on adrenaline, or are you feeling weaker from the loss of blood? No, no, no. I'm okay. You know, I, I, when I got shot for about five seconds, I, I just crunched like a baby. Okay, and and I, I was just shocked, and straight on my head, I thought. What the fuck am I going to do? I've just bought a new house in the UK. How the fuck? I'm not serious. How the fuck am I going to pay for my mortgage? That's amazing, that's the truth. man. That's amazing. But that's the truth. Anyway, you know, the enemy didn't stop. They still still coming. Pete, were you able to follow this from the bot house? Did, did you know what was going on? No, not really. It was still, because it was a monsoon, the, the, the visibility wasn't very good. You know, it's still a lot of mist about. Don't forget, we were occupied looking the other of way. Course, they had, of course, the, the of course. The enemy running across the uh, yeah, across yeah. the plain. You know, that's what, we, what that's what I was looking at. You know, I, I'd lost track of what was going on up at the gun pit. Right. That was a situation. And all that was left then, of course, I was tacked. Um, you know, with this round lodged millimeters from his spine and firing an SLR, you know, the yeah. self-loading rifle. Yeah. Hell of a kick. And he had to fire that with his, with his, one of his arms was out of action, propped up against the sandbags. Wow. So that was the situation that we were in. And then back at the, the bat house, uh, Mike Keeley uh, realized that we're on the verge of being overrun. He couldn't see what was going on. He knew that the 25 pounder had stopped firing. He knew there was little activity within the um, the gun pit, but he also knew that the Adu were crawling closer and closer to achieving their objective. So he thought, I, I need to find out what's going on over there. I need a sit rep. So he right. grabbed the Toka and it was Laba Laba, send sit rep, silence. Tack, tack, send sit rep, silence. Third time lucky. No chance. So he made a personal decision that he would run up to the fort, reinforce it, and find out what was happening himself. And uh, he asked for volunteers. So me and Bob Bennett, we stepped forward. Uh, they told Bob, you can't go. You're uh, uh, controlling the mortars. Pete, you can't go. You're controlling the radio. So he took Tommy Tobin, who was one of the best um, medics in B Squadron at the time. He'd just done the hospital attachment down in uh, A&E at uh, Oxford 
so he was up to speed with the uh, trauma and he also he also had this top of the range medical pack with something like three dozen threats of morphine broke wow. every rule in the book you're only <laughs> supposed to have about half a dozen i don't know where he got those from but don't forget subterfuge is an uh, is an sas skill yes. <laughs> so that was it the decision was taken um they grabbed their assault rifles and off they went out of the um front door of the bat house uh, 800 meters mad mad dash pepper potting forward one man running one man covering one man running one man covering and i, I was watching them again i could see the tracer cracking over there i thought any minute now any minute you know they've they they more or less ran through a blizzard of green tracer but a very very serious close quarter battle then developed you know with the adu closing to uh grenade throwing range and they started lobbing grenades right one grenade landed near tack didn't explode another grenade landed near the the ammo bunker rolled over the parapet of the the ammo and landed at um mike keely's feet didn't explode oh my god and that was the adu's big big mistake um the seven P's prior planning and preparation prevents piss poor performance, you know, right, right, service, right. serviceability of kit and equipment because it was, you see, because it was the monsoon, uh, everything got damp. Every day ah. was damp and drizzly fuses got, got damp and the, the, the grenade, they never bothered to change their grenade fuses. They'd uh, had them in there probably for weeks, you know, getting into position, you know, and, and the fuses on the, the grenades were, were damp. So wow. the the grenades weren't going off. Um, that one that landed near TAC, if that had gone off, that would have definitely killed TAC. And the one the one that landed at Mike Keeley's feet definitely would have ke killed Mike Keeley. Um, uh, so they would have then overrun the position and uh, taken out the um, taken out the, the, the uh, twenty five yeah. pounder. The old 25-pound artillery piece was critical. Tak and the others knew that if it fell into the Adu's hands, they would use it to level the bad house and the battle would be over. Laba not only operated the 25-pound gun single-handedly, but also gave his life to protect it. Fifty years after the battle, you can still hear the emotion in Tak's voice. Without Laba's heroics, none of them would have survived. Once they had the 25 pound, they could have turned it onto the uh, the bat house, and at 800 meters, they would have flattened, they would have flattened the bat house, flattened me. I wouldn't have been sat here. Tack wouldn't have been well. Tack would have been killed with the uh, the grenade uh, fragments. Um, and we did hear later from a uh, interrogation of a uh, uh, prisoner of war that they had a special team trained up to fire the 25 pounder trained trained by a ex-corporal from the Omani artillery who defected to the uh, communist corps. So, so they were prepared. They were, they were ready. Pre oh, they were ready. They thought they were going to get that gun and they were going to flap. Once they had the gun, that would have been game over, basically. Yeah, they would have flattened us, you know. Um, so uh, luckily, luckily, uh, those grenades didn't go off. You know, wow, that, what that, a miracle, uh, man! Wow, yeah, that 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 probably that you know, they lost the battle through the planning and preparation. There's seven P's, Ralph. Yeah, <laughs> uh, prior planning and preparation prevents piss poor performance. <laughs> yeah, 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 Amazing. <laughs> drummed into you, drummed into you in training. Obviously, the, the Russians and the Chinese haven't, uh, haven't heard that one. So, uh, now we're what like it's into the morning now, right. Uh, yeah, they... yeah, we're still waiting for the jets again. Don't forget, um, so they've they've gone back to to refuel. Uh, I mean, at, at this stage of the game, the situation has now gone from uh, serious to desperate. We were only um, we were down to only six fully fit fighting men, and the five O Brownies out of action because I'm down in the signal shack. Call it for Star Trek. Situation desperate, send Star Trek. Situation desperate, send Star Trek. Over and over again. Until finally... So you have to keep running back downstairs to, to that's send, right, out, yeah, the, yeah. Up, to send down, out the comms. That's yeah. What, yeah, I used to run up, fire off a belt of uh, five O Browning, back down to the radio, 
send reinforcements, situation desperate, back up, oh, back was the call, you know, SAS, throw them in at the deep end. They'll <laughs> they'll carry the good. They'll carry the, uh, they, they carry the day, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um, there Fantastic. you go. That's how they think we are. They think we're all supermen, you know. But um, uh, so that was it. Situation desperate said, and eventually um, RAF Salala sparked up and uh, Wing Commander uh, Bill Stoker in charge of the Sultan's jets um, decided to la launch two more strike masters. And uh, about just after mid morning, two jets suddenly burst through the, um, the clouds over uh, Murbat Bay, um, wheeling and diving and uh, did a strafing run up the um, uh, perimeter wire using rocket and cannon. Bill Stoker, lead jet, coming in low, low, very fast, uh, using the deafening sound of his jet That must have been a welcome sight, huh? Yeah, to try wow. and panic. The, he skimmed over the top of them, 100 metres. <laughs> broke, broke every rule in the book, you know. And, of course, on the fourth pass, um, he attracted ground fire, AK-47, Spargan, from Jebel Ali, and uh, his jet was riddled, 12.7 Spargan, straight through the fuel, fuel tank. Oh, so no. he had to um, bank uh, left off, left over the fort, disappeared into a cloud, and uh, limped back to RAF Salal and did an emergency land. So that was it, back down to one jet again. And the Adu were now in a position to put in the final assault. What they'd done in the dead ground, they they crawled through the perimeter wire in the dead ground, hidden by the fort, and crawled up to their final assault positions, which was the two the two corners uh, of the fort, um, right and left of arc, only feet away from the gun position, only feet away from the ammo bunker, and they were about to put in their final assault. Mike Keeley then realised that um, they're going to be we're going to be over overrun executed probably so he made the decision that would um that would win him the uh, dso the distinguished service order he grabbed the tokai and it was fuzz fuzz fire mission one mortar i want rounds down on my position i want you to frag my position now fuzz wow. was like what what <laughs> yes fuzz, shoot at me fire, yeah fire, yeah fire mission one one mortar Rounds down along the perimeter wire, corner of the fort, round the ammo bunker, round the uh, gun pit. Uh, rapid fire now. Well, Fuzz, being one of the finest mortal men of his uh, generation, realised how dangerous this was going to be. 800 metres, line of sight, off the tripod, um, high angle shoot. I mean, one wobble. Yeah, one and you land right in the bunker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Blue on blue, blue on blue. Um Fuzz took a deep breath, grabbed the first um, mortar bomb and started feeding the beast. Fuzz, Fuzz put down a rain of steel along the perimeter wire, along the um, gun pit, the ammo bunker, put a, a rain of steel down. And so with the combination of Fuzz's superb mortar fire control uh, and the, the last yes. remaining jet, um, this finally broke the Adu attack. Wow. You could, hear, you could hear the sound of gunfire dying down. You could hear the um, cacophony of sound drifting away. I thought, yeah, this is it. We're going to get a result. This is good. We're going to get a result. The Adu realise it's a lost cause. The Adu are uh, on the, on the uh, back foot. Real elation. Better than winning the World Cup. <laughs> 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 didn't last lot didn't last long though did it i was just watching the last remaining jet um his ordinance totally expending a race away into the distance waggling his wings in a in a victory roll when i when i saw these figures on the uh, skyline um heading towards uh Murbat at speed i thought who are those guys um who are they i thought can't be. The Adu have regrouped. They're putting in a counter-attack. And I'm down to my last box of 5-0 Browning. Oh, my God. I thought, I'm not finished yet. Russian troops or Russian trained troops, communist troops, do not make decisions. They refer upwards. I thought, if I can take the officer out, 
they'll be like headless chickens. Uh, they won't know what to do next, which way to go. And most of the leaders, they all wore these big silver whistles around ah. the neck ah, so uh, to, to donate officer or senior NCO. So that was what I was going to look for, the whistle. And uh, take that guy out with the fire. I had the, the range with the 5-0 Browning. And I'd take the officer out. I reached for the binos. I was just about to uh, scan the extended line looking for the officer when suddenly they all disappeared down this um uh this wadi that ran down to the coast almost immediately this this huge amount of fire erupted i thought i thought who's firing at who and i could see um red tracer mixed with the green i thought they had they had who don't have um uh, red tracer they only have green what's going on it was then that the uh, the radio in the the bat house burst into life and it was bat house bat house uh this is g squadron contact contact you are totally surrounded you are being outflanked um south of the town um we are advancing to to contact wait out g squadron reinforcements yeah g squadron reinforcements they'd only been in the place about 24 hours they're actually on the range fixing their weapons when they got the call, it's wow. all going down at Merba. So they jumped on the chop and they were choppered in to south of the, that was them coming over the hill, which we thought was the, uh, the Adu reinforcements. But in fact, it was G squadron, um, wow. saved the day. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Wow. What is, what a, what a I sigh thought, of relief, uh, man. Now, now we're going to get a result. There's no way the Adu can beat a full squadron of SES. Nobody beats a full squadron of the SAS. That includes <laughs> that includes the Russian and the Chinese. The Battle of Murbat was over. The enemy were in uh, were in full retreat. Despite overwhelming odds, the SAS team fought off over 400 Adu rebels for more than six hours. It was a resounding victory and a huge blow to the morale of communist forces in the Middle East. Sadly, the Brits lost brave Sergeant Talayasi Labalaba and medic Tommy Tobin in the process. Others, including Tak, were severely injured, but managed to survive. 46 years later, in 2018, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, Duke and Duchess of Sussex, traveled to the island of Fiji to dedicate a statue to Labalaba in honor of his heroism at the Battle of Merbat. Pete and Tak were there to pay an emotional tribute to their fallen brother-in-arms. The 25-pound gun that Laba operated now sits on display in the Royal Artillery Museum. We thank Sergeant Laba Laba and the entire SAS team for their bravery, and especially Pete and Tak for joining us. They're today's heroes behind the headlines. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Ralph Pizzullo. If you want to hear more stories like this, don't forget to subscribe and tune in next time to Heroes Behind Headlines.